with your channel, what, four, three? Uh, we're with Vice News. What happened? They called this apocalypse because there's always crime and stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. Somebody got murdered right here. Someone got murdered just here? Murdered. It is Saturday night in Kansas City and this year they're having a record-breaking homicide rate and we've just heard that there's been a shooting right here. The only thing that we know about him at this time is that it's a young black male, early 20s. So how many homicides this year have you had here in Kansas City? This puts us at 111, so we are up about 40% from where we were at this time last year. How's the relationship between the cops and the people around this area? <laughs> it ain't no relationship. Kansas City is in a moment of crisis. There have been nearly 200 murders so far this year, and federal agents have been sent to help out with the city's violence. But like elsewhere across the country, trust in the police, particularly among black communities, has never been worse. The killing of George Floyd and recent shootings of black people here and across America have forced Kansas City to reckon with their own police department and demand accountability for officers. Kansas City has one of the highest rates of police killings in the country. But the police and the conservative board it reports to are resistant to change. There's a support rally outside the police headquarters today. A lot of wives of police officers, a lot of members of the police union have shown up. And then a small group of counter protests have also shown up demanding police reforms. Just going to show how divided the city is at the moment. What is it particularly that you're protesting when it comes to the police? We're protesting the systemic racism in Kansas City policing. The system is broken and it disproportionately and negatively affects brown and black people in Kansas City. Do you think there could be situations where police officers are to blame for the killings of uh, of unarmed Not black in Kansas men? City. Not in Kansas I've City. I've seen other cities, but I don't believe it's happening in Kansas City. She's one of the protesters there. Why do you want to disarm her? I see that she's leading a mob usually, and trying to incite people to violence. And these people are not. There was a lady over there that came out and said, no, this is going to be peaceful. I that. That was Stacey Shaw. No, it wasn't. It was the lady in the skirt over there in the yellow. Yeah, that's Stacey Shaw. Okay, then I'm mistaken. I thought Stacey Shaw was the one with the bullhorn. It means so much to me to know that men and women came out and they support us. It's getting bigger. People on our side are believing more. Brad Lemon, the local union president, has been rallying support for cops who killed civilians. The courts have all showed it's not about what I would do, right? It's about what a person in those shoes at that time would do. You know, a lot of the stuff we do on video, um, while legal and right and righteous, uh, still isn't pretty. When somebody points a gun at you, there is nothing you can do. There is no training. You can't walk away and de-escalate a situation when a person has a gun. De-escalating potentially violent situations is exactly what the police attempt to train. It's going to be three, three second turns and position changes in between. Watch your targets. But a large part of police training is determining whether or not someone has a lethal weapon. And if they do, it's shoot to kill. We're just heading into simulation training, which is where officers are presented with different real life scenarios to see how they'd respond and whether or not they draw their gun, whether or not they fire. And they said that I can have a go. Yeah, pepper spray. You have a taser. You have a shotgun that's already in your cruiser. All right. Hey, sir, for me. Hey, sir. Sir, get back inside. Finger goes in the trigger well, you're gonna aim 
the sights, pick up that sight picture really quick, and you're gonna fire. There you go. Just to show off with, this is something we give the recruits. I'm just gonna give you people coming at you and you decide when you should, maybe when you shouldn't shoot. Mm -hmm. Put the gun down! Put the thing down! <laughs> Put whatever you got down! Should I have fired him? No. That was, a le that was a less than lethal. So you could have used the taser or the pepper spray, something like that. It really does get your adrenaline pumping, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it does. It's, it's about as real as you can get. In yeah, it feels pretty real. <laughs> As you can see from being through that, that's a decision that happens just, just like second. that. Yeah. Okay. Do you think there's any possible way I could have handled this situation without killing him? No. Really, at that point, you are defending that citizen. There's nothing else you could have done. How do you know that your adrenaline and the fact that you have a gun here isn't going to play a part in whether or not well, I shoot? The adrenaline, the endorphins, the cortisol, all yeah. play a big part you're gonna to start to tunnel in on something, and that's what you have to avoid. Yes, All right, you've already pulled out, gone 1023 with the dispatcher, right? Yes, sir. The recruits always anticipate that this is the virtual machine, I'm probably gonna to have to shoot. Is because that mentality that. something that you take out into the streets? No, we train that out of them. You said it down. Right, you want me to put the block down? Yes, sir. Put the block down, huh? Yeah, I'll put sir, the block sir, down. Sir, 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 put it down. Sir. If every move a black person makes is having you fear for your life, find a new job. Shootings happen far more than anyone would like. Terence Bridges was one of several black men killed by Kansas City police in recent years. My brother was robbed of his life. His life mattered. He loved cooking. He was a family man. He was our, he was our protector. My brother wanted to be something, wanted to do something with his life. And that was robbed. He was robbed of that. His life was stolen. I'm going to be Terrence Bridges' voice. So he's still going to be heard. It's him and my daughter when she was a little baby. Oh, that's him? That's Terrence? Yeah, that's Terrence. And that's my daughter, Ernisha. That's his niece. Aww. He's good with children? Oh, yeah. He yeah, is really good with children. This is a picture of all of us. My mama, on my little brother um, high school graduation, when he went on prom, this all my mama kids. You guys all look very close. Yeah, we real close. We was, yeah, real close. When was this taken? This was like before he got killed. This was in Kansas City. He was at a party in Kansas City. So this was just party. right before he was killed? Yeah. And this is when my first and man was all this picture of me and all my kids together. When they was all alive and happy. <laughs> I miss him, man. He was he was everything. Mm -hmm. Just after midnight on May 26, 2019, Terence Bridges got into a fight with his girlfriend Shonda. Shonda ran to a neighbor's who called 911, saying that Bridges had a gun and had forced his way into his house. Officer Dylan Pfeiffer responded. Bridges, who had driven away from the scene, walked back to the house on foot. When Pfeiffer claims he saw Bridges lift his hands as if he had a gun, he shot him once in the chest. Pfeiffer claimed he feared for his life. Vice News obtained unreleased dashcam video from that night where you can hear the last moments before Bridges died. Why'd you attack me, dude? I didn't attack you. Roll over! Roll over! It's on your stomach! Terence Bridges was pronounced dead at the hospital. There was no gun. They didn't even give him a chance. They didn't tell him to freeze or nothing. Like, they gave no command for him to do it. He just took his life. What was going through your mind when you received that phone call? I said, this can't be true. Not him, he promised he ain't gonna never leave me. I said, this can't be true. 
this can't be true. I mean, that just broke my heart. So be it. Like, I could replay that moment back. It just, I just get emotional sometimes. Why do you think it was that that officer shot him? Because he was a black man. Because he was a black man. And I live with that, and I'm a dad with that. He was a black man. After Terrence was shot and killed, do you know what happened to that officer? Yeah, they let him back to work. He was back at work. Do you feel like him being back at work poses a threat to society? Yes, he yes, he's gonna kill again because he got he think he got away with killing my son. Yeah, he'll do it again. Officer Pfeiffer was not indicted for killing Bridges. Nine days after the shooting, he was back at work. Vice News learned that six months later, in November 2019, Pfeiffer was out on patrol when he was dispatched to join a high-speed car chase. The two black men they were pursuing allegedly matched the description of burglars at a 7-Eleven. Where I was with, we were just in a car and the police had rolled past. Then we pulled off and then I swung out of nowhere, they just got behind us. MR asked that we only use his initials and not show his face out of fear of police retribution. He was one of the passengers of the car. He was 15. MR admits they did keep driving after police started their pursuit. He says he was afraid of what the cops would do. When I got out the car, uh, I had turned around and was the officer told me to get on the ground and call to him. So I started calling after I called towards him. Uh, they had my hands behind my back, and after he had put the handcuffs on, like he just grabbed the back of my head and then slammed me into the concrete. How yeah. hard did he slam you? Hard enough that my teeth broke. He started kneeling on my neck with his knee. I started saying that I couldn't breathe. Police reports show that Officer Dylan Pfeiffer restrained and helped handcuff MR. His superior, Matthew Neal, slammed his head into the concrete and pressed down with his knee, according to MR and another officer at the scene. MR's account matches statements he made to the police, as well as officer testimony. That night, MR got six stitches in his forehead. After I went to the hospital, I was in the room with the officer. He had me cuffed to the bed or whatever, and asked me where I want to go, and I said I want to go home. And then he just walked out, and I never heard of her, never heard again. Then that's when I got up and I called my mom. She was scared for me. She was crying. We both agreed that we'll go uh, file a report because we don't want it to happen to the next person. Later on, both Pfeiffer and Neil denied using excessive force. Initially, MR's complaint was sustained against both officers, Pfeiffer and Neil. But according to documents obtained by Vice News, the chief of police's office intervened. On the chief's recommendation, the complaint against Pfeiffer was dropped. Do you think it was just the one cop that was responsible, or do you think all of them were responsible? Well, I think all of them were responsible. Well, all the ones that seen it, because if I was a cop, I would have told him to stop. That's not a procedure. Violent arrests like MR's have happened before. Get on the ground. Stop. Behind your back. Put on your the ground. Your back. The incidents shown in these dash cam videos all led to confidential settlements between the Kansas City police and those being arrested. Though the department did not admit liability in these cases. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! You would quit pulling away from me, I wouldn't have to throw you down. Now stop. Stop what you're doing right now. You're tensing up. Okay, you just hey, back up. Back up. Before new recruits graduate the academy, they are tested on how to respond to these types of situations, including those similar to what happened to MR. Fuck you, man. You're the whole reason I got off duty here. It's all because of you. They had a higher off duty because you're breaking in here. I come in here, then you punch me in the face. Punch me in the face. Punch me in the face. In the classroom, it's easier for recruits to tell their superior to stop. All right, sir, go over to your butt. Count three, you're gonna stand up. One, two, three. 
When you walked in the door, I just I want to get your thoughts on what you saw. I immediately saw the stripes. That's the first thing I saw. I saw you was a sergeant, and I saw him mouthing him. He had his he had the handcuffs on, and he was rear mounted, which we shouldn't be because it restricts airflow. Why is it with all this training that there are still instances of police officers within this department using excessive force? Well, anywhere in the country you go, you're still human. At some point, you're going to see red, and you're going to have a bad reaction. Police work's a dangerous thing, and you can just hope that you get compliance. If you don't, then you go right back to use only that force necessary to affect the arrest or the detention, and that's about all we can do. Other people in the city and across the nation feel like police are targeting black people in particular. Do you feel like there is any way around that? No. I really don't. The best way I can describe it is if you are patrolling a majorly white area, a majority of those contacts are going to be with white people. We have cultural diversity classes, but as far as on calls, the officers are expected to just look at the individuals who are there. They just have to know that there's, you know, two types of people in the world, good people and bad people. But and is that a realistic matter. ask of people to not see skin color? Uh, you know, with the generations we have coming up right now, I've got an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old, and they, they don't see that. But as far as training that out of somebody or training somebody not to see that, I don't really know where you would start with that, other than giving them the cultural diversity classes that we already give. Missouri law does give officers a lot of leeway to use force when making an arrest. And in Kansas City, no officer had been criminally charged. But this year, the political climate has shifted. Two KCPD officers have been indicted for assault. Ten, a Kansas City officer indicted for the deadly shooting of 26-year-old Cameron Lamb. He was shot and killed at his home December 3rd. All officers pleaded not guilty. The charges have fueled calls for the chief of police to resign. There have been a number of cases within your department where there's been officer-involved shootings and they've gone back to being on duty a few days later. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that is enough time to do a thorough investigation? Th that decision is usually made by medical providers. You know, we, we send them to somebody um, to see if they're okay. We then review on, on the cursory of what happened. If we don't see anything that's, um, you know, criminal in our minds on, that just comes off the, the the top of our heads to say, wow, that was really out of bounds, then we usually send them back to work. That's correct. Deciding in a matter of a few days off the top of your heads whether or not something is criminal is, is very difficult. Do you see that sending someone back to work who could be a danger to society could be an issue? I, I think we have to decide what is that perfect time then, if, if it's not to send them back to work right away. Some of our investigations, our use of force reports that some of our county prosecutors have taken four years to come back. Do I hold an officer out for four years? I'm saying, is that officer a danger to somebody else? Or did that officer do what they did in the performance of their duties as they were trained? And I think that's a call I have to make. The current procedural instructions for use of force don't require de-escalation. Is it time that that's that was changed? The wording in our procedural instructions is that we will value human life above all else. And in so, we will only use enough force necessary to make an arrest. I don't think we have an abundance use of force here. I think the message through training and through our wording is that you will do everything minimal to do what you have to do to make your job work. Uh, do we have issues? Yes, we do. But I, I don't see this as an overriding issue in Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. There's a lot of calls from community leaders, from activists, from the general public for you to step down. Mm -hmm. Are you planning on doing that anytime in the future? I'm not. I think what this police department is doing here is the right things. So do I think we can do better on some things? Absolutely. But do I think this police department is doing what's best for this city? And do I think the people, the men and women who are out there in uniform are doing the right things for the right reasons? I do think that. On Friday, the prosecutor's office charged Sergeant Neal with felony assault for his treatment of MR. When someone is in handcuffs and they are cooperating, no one should disagree, no one should believe it's provocative that we ask for better behavior. Sergeant Neal is currently suspended. His lawyer, who was appointed by the police union, says Neal plans to fight the charges. 
Kansas City Police Department would not comment on Officer Pfeiffer's involvement in the Bridges killing or MR's alleged assault. Pfeiffer is still on duty. If something does happen to those cops, do you think the KCPD, the Kansas City Police Department, will be better off? Well, I'm pretty sure they got more cops like that because a lot of the cops that was there, they act like they ain't see nothing. I mean, it'll make a little difference because you got like one or two of them or a couple of them off, but it's still more bad cops out there. I try my best to stay away from cops or anything like that after the situation. Do you feel scared? Yeah, terrified. If they can do it to me, they can do it to anybody else.